Pride and Prejudice, Chapter 8, and No Cow So Far. At five o'clock, the two ladies retired the dress, and at a half past six, Elizabeth was summoned to dinner. To the several inquiries which then poured in, and amongst which she had the pleasure of distinguishing the much superior solitude of Mr. Bingley's, she could not make a very favorable answer. Jane was by no means better. The sisters, on hearing this, repeated three or four times how much they were grieved, how shocking it was to have a cold, and how excessively they disliked being ill themselves, and then thought no more of the matter. And their indifference towards Jane, when not immediately before them, restored Elizabeth to the enjoyment of all her former dislike. Their brother, indeed, was the only one of the party whom she could regard with any complacency. His anxiety for Jane was evident, and his attentions to herself most pleasing, and they prevented her from feeling herself so much an intruder as she believed she was considered by others. She had very little notice from any but him. Miss Bingley was engrossed by Mr. Darcy, her sister scarcely less so. And as for Mr. Hertz by whom Elizabeth sat, he was an indolent man, who lived only to eat, drink, and play cards, who, when he found her to prefer a plain dish to ragu, had nothing to say to her. When dinner was over, she returned directly to Jane, and Miss Bingley began abusing her as soon as she was out of the room. Her manners were pronounced to be very bad indeed, a mixture of pride and impertinence. She had no conversation, no style, no beauty. Miss Hertz thought the same and added, She has nothing, in short, to recommend her, but it being an excellent walker, I shall never forget her appearance this morning. She really almost looked wild. She did, indeed, Louisa. I could hardly keep my countenance. Very nonsensical to come at all. Why must she be scampering about the country because her sister has a cold? Her hair so untidy, so blousy. Yes, in her petticoat. I hope you saw her petticoat six inches deep in mud. I am absolutely certain. And the gown which has been let down to hide it is not its office. Your picture may be very exact, Louise, said Bingley, but this was all lost upon me. I thought Miss Elizabeth Bennet looked remarkably well when she came into the room this morning. Her dirty petticoat quite escaped my notice. You observed it, Mr. Darcy, I'm sure said Miss Bingley, and I am inclined to think that you would not wish to seek your sister make such an exhibition. Certainly not. To walk three miles, or four miles, or five miles, or whatever it is, above her ankles in dirt, and alone, quite alone. What could she mean by it? It seems to me to show an abominable sort of conceited independence, a most country town indifference to decorum. It shows an affection for her sister that is very pleasing, said Bingley. I'm afraid, Mr. Darcy, observed Miss Bingley in half a whisper, that this adventure has rather affected your admiration for her fine eyes. Not at all, he replied. They were brightened by exercise. A short pause followed the speech, and Miss Hertz began again. I have an excessive regard for Miss Jane Bennet. She is really a very sweet girl, and I wish with all my heart that she were well settled. But with such a father and mother and such low connections, I'm afraid there is no chance of it. I think I have heard you say that their uncle's an attorney in Merrington. Yes, and they have another, who lives somewhere near Cheapside. That is capital, added her sister, and they both began laughing heartedly. If they had uncles enough to fill all of Cheapside, cried Bindley, it would not be enough to make them one jolt less agreeable. To this speech, Bingley made no answer, but his sisters gave it their hearty assent, and indulged their mirth for some time at the expense of their dear friend's vulgar relations. With a renewal of tenderness, however, they returned to her room on leaving the dinner parlor, and sat with her till summoned to coffee. She was still very poorly, and Elizabeth would not quit her at all, till late in the evening, when she had the comfort of seeing her sleep, and when it seemed to her rather right than pleasant that she should go downstairs herself. On entering the drawing-room, she found the whole party at loo, 
and was immediately invited to join them. But suspecting them to be playing music high, she declined it, and making her sister the excuse, she would amuse herself for the short time she could stay below with the book. Mr. Hurst looked at her with astonishment. Do you prefer reading to cards, he said. That is rather singular. Miss Eliza Bennet, said Miss Bingley, despises cards. She is a great reader and has no pleasure in anything else. I deserve neither such praise nor such censure, cried Elizabeth. I am not a great reader, and I have pleasure in many things. In nursing your sister, I am sure you have pleasure, said Bingley, and I hope it will soon be increased by seeing her quite well. Elizabeth thanked him from her heart and then walked towards the table where a few books were lying. He immediately offered to fetch her others, all that his library afforded. And I wish my collection were larger for your benefit and my own credit, but I am an idle fellow. And though I have not many, I have more than I ever looked into. Elizabeth assured him that she could suit herself perfectly with those in the room. I am astonished, said Miss Bingley, that my father should have left so small a collection of books. What a delightful library you have at Pemberley, Mr. Darcy. It ought to be good, he replied. It's been the work of many generations. And then you have added to it so much yourself that you are always buying books. I cannot comprehend the neglect of a family library in such days as these. Neglect? I am sure you neglect nothing that can be added to the beauties of that noble place. Charles, when you built your house, I wish it may be half as delightful as the Pemberley. I wish it may. But... I would really advise you to make your purchase in that neighborhood and take Pemberley for a kind of model. There's not a finer county in England than Derbyshire. With all my heart, I will buy Pemberley itself if Darcy will sell it. I am talking of possibilities, Charles. Upon my word, Caroline, I should think it more possible to get Pemberley by purchase than imitation. Elizabeth was so much caught with what passed as to leave her very little attention for her book, and soon laying it down wholly aside, she drew near the card table and stationed herself between Mr. Bingley and his elder sister to observe the game. Is Miss Darcy grown much since the spring? said Miss Bingley. Will she be as tall as I am? I think she will. She is now about Miss Elizabeth Bennet's height, or rather taller. How I long to see her again. I never met anyone who delighted me so much. Such a countenance, and such manners, and so extremely accomplished for her age. Her performance on the piano for it is extensive. It is amazing to me, said Bingley, how young ladies can have patience to be so very accomplished as they all are. All young ladies are accomplished, my dear Charles. What do you mean? Yes, all of them, I think. They all paint tables, cover screens, and net purses. I scarcely know anyone who cannot do all of this, and I am sure I have never heard a young lady spoken of for the first time without being informed that she is very accomplished. You're a list of the common extent of accomplishments, said Darcy, has too much truth. The word is applied to many a woman who deserves it no otherwise than netting a purse or covering a screen. But I am very far from agreeing with you in your estimation of ladies in general. I cannot generally boast of knowing more than half a dozen in the whole range of my acquaintance that they really are accomplished. Nor am I, I am sure, said Miss Bingley. Then, observed Elizabeth, you must comprehend a great deal in your idea of an accomplished woman. Yes, I do comprehend a great deal in it. Oh, certainly cried the faithful assistant, no one can really be esteemed accomplished who does not greatly surpass what is usually met with. A woman must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, and the modern languages to deserve the word. And beside all of this, she must possess a certain something in the air of manner of walking, the tone of her voice, the address and the expressions, or the word will be half-deserved. 
and to all this, she must add something more substantial in the improvement of her mind by extensive reading. I am no longer surprised at your knowing only six accomplished women. I would rather wonder now at your knowing any. Are you so severe upon your own sex as to doubt the possibility of all this? I never saw such a woman. I never saw such capacity and taste and application and elegance as you described united. Miss Hurst and Miss Bingley both cried out against the injustice of her implied doubt and were both protesting that they knew many women who answered this description. When Mr. Hurst called them to order with bitter complaints of their inattention to what was going forward. As all conversation was thereby at an end, Elizabeth soon afterwards left the room. Elizabeth Bennet, said Miss Bingley, when the door was closed on her, is one of those young ladies who seek to recommend themselves to other sexes by undervaluing their own. And with many men, it succeeds. I dare say it succeeds, but in my opinion, it's a paltry device and a very mean art. Undoubtedly replied Darcy, to whom this remark was chiefly addressed. There is a meanness in all the arts which ladies sometimes condescend to employ for captivation. Whatever bears infinity to cunning is desirable. Miss Bingley was not entirely satisfied with this reply as to continue the subject. Elizabeth joined them again only to say that her sister was worse and that she could not leave her. Bingley urged Mr. Jones being sent for immediately, while his sisters, convinced that no country advice would be of any service, recommended an express to town for one of the most eminent positions. This she would not hear of, but she was not so unwilling to comply with their brother's proposal, and it was settled that Mr. Jones should be sent for early in the morning if Miss Bennet were not decidedly better. Bingley was quite comfortable. His sisters declared that they were miserable. They solaced their wretchedness, however, by duets after supper, and while he could find no better relief to control his feelings than giving his housekeeper directions that every attention might be paid to the sick lady and her sister. Chapter 9 Elizabeth passed the chief of the night in her sister's room, and in the morning had the pleasure of being able to send a tolerable answer to the inquiries which she was very early received from Mr. Bingley by a housemaid, and sometimes after from the two elegant ladies who waited on his sisters. In spite of this amendment, however, she had requested to have a note sent to Longburn, desiring her mother to visit Jane, and form her own judgment of her situation. The note was immediately dispatched, and its contents as quickly compiled with Miss Bennet, accompanied by her two youngest girls, reached Netherfield soon after the family breakfast. Had she found Jane in any apparent danger, Miss Bennet would have been very miserable. But being satisfied on seeing her that her illness was not alarming, she had no wish of her recovering immediately for her restoration to health would probably remove her from Netherfield. She would not listen, therefore, to her daughter's proposal of being carried home. Neither did the apothecary, who arrived at the same time, think it was all advisable. After sitting a while with Jane on Miss Bingley's appearance and invitation, the mother and the three daughters all attended into the breakfast parlor. Bingley met them with hopes that Miss Bennet had not found Miss Bennet worse than she expected. Indeed I have, sir, was her answer. She is a great deal too ill to be moved. Mr. Jones says we must not think of moving her. We must trespass a little longer on your kindness. Removed, cried Bingley. It must not be thought of. My sister, I am sure, will not hear of her removal. You may depend on it, ma'am said Miss Bingley with cold shrubbery, that Miss Bennet will receive every possible attention while she remains with us. Miss Bennet was profused in her acknowledgments. I am sure, she added, if it was not for such good friends, I do not know what would become of her, for she is very ill indeed and suffers a vast deal, though with the greatest patience in the world, which is always the way with her. 
for she has, without exception, the sweetest temper I have ever met with. I often tell my other girls they are nothing to her. You have a sweet room here, Mr. Bingley, and a charming prospect over the gravel walk. I do not know a place in the country that is equal to Netherfield. You will not think of quitting it in a hurry, I hope, though you but have a short lease. Whatever I do is done in a hurry, replied he, and therefore if I shall resolve to quit Netherfield, I should probably be off in five minutes. At present, however, I consider myself as quite fixed here. That is exactly what I should have supposed of you, said Elizabeth. You begin to comprehend me, do you? cried he, turning towards her. Oh, yes, I understand you perfectly. I wish I might take this for a compliment, but to be so easily seen, though I am afraid, is pitiful. That is as it happens. It does not follow that a deep, intricate character is more or less estimable. Lizzie, cried her mother, remember where you are, and do not run on in the wild manner that you are suffered to do at home. I did not know before, continued Bingley immediately, that you were a studier of character. It must be an amusing study. Yes, but intricate characters are the most amusing. They have the least that advantage. The country, said Darcy, can in general supply but a few subjects for such a study. In a country neighborhood, you move in a very confined and un varying society. But people themselves alter so much that there is something new to be observed in them forever. Yes, indeed, cried Miss Bennet, offended by his manner of mentioning a country neighborhood. I assure you there is quite as much of that going on in the country as in town. Everyone was surprised, and Darcy, after looking at her for a moment, turned silently away. Miss Bennet, who fancied she had gained a complete victory over him, continued her triumph. I cannot see that London has any great advantage over the country. For my part, except the shops and public places, the country is a vast deal pleasanter, to her, is it not, Mr. Bingley? When I am in the country, he replied, I never wish to leave it. And when I am in town, it is pretty much the same. They have each their advantages, and I can equally be happy in either. Aye, that is because you have the right disposition. But that gentleman, looking at Darcy, seemed to think the country was nothing at all. Indeed, Mama, you are mistaken, said Elizabeth, blushing for her mother. You quite mistook Mr. Darcy. He only meant that there was not such a variety of people to be met with in the country as in the town, which you must acknowledge to be true. Certainly, my dear, nobody said that there were, but as to not meeting with many people in this neighborhood, I believe there are few neighborhoods larger. I know we dine with four and twenty families. Nothing but concern for Elizabeth could enable Bingley to keep his countenance. His sister was less delicate and directed her eyes towards Mr. Darcy with a very expressive smile. Elizabeth, for the sake of saying something that might turn her mother's thoughts, now asked her if Charlotte Lucas had been at Longburn since her coming away. Yes, she called yesterday with her father. What an agreeable man Sir Williams is, Mr. Bingley, is he not? So much of the man of fashion, so gentile and easy. He always had something to say to everyone. That is my idea of good breeding, and those persons who fancy themselves very important and never open their mouths quite mistake the matter. Did Charlotte dine with you? No, she would go home. I fancy she was wanted about the mince pies. For my part, Mr. Bingley, I always keep servants that can do their own work. My daughters are brought up very differently. But everybody is the judge for themselves, and the Lucases are a very good sort of girls, I assure you. It is a pity they are not handsome. Not that I think Charlotte is so very plain, but just she is our particular friend. She seems a very pleasant young woman. Oh dear, yes, but you must own she is very plain. Lady Lucas herself has often said so, and envied me Jane's beauty. I do not like to boast of my own child, but to be sure, Jane, 
one does not often see anyone better looking. It is what everyone says. I do not trust my own partiality. When she was only 15, there was a man at my brother Gardner's in town so much in love with her that my sister-in-law was sure that he would make her an offer before we came away. But, however, he did not. Perhaps he thought her too young. However, he wrote some verses on her, and very pretty they were. And so it ended his affection, said Elizabeth impatiently. There has been many a one, I fancy, overcome in the same way. I wonder who first discovered the efficiency of poetry in driving away love. I have been used to consider poetry as the food of love, said Darcy. Of a fine, stout, healthy love it may. Everything nourishes what is strong already. But if it is the only a sight, then sort of inclination, I am convinced that one good sonnet will starve it away entirely. Darcy only smiled. And the general pause which ensued made Elizabeth tremble lest her mother should be exposing herself again. She longed to speak, but could think of nothing to say, and after a short silence, Miss Bennet began repeating her thanks to Mr. Bingley for his kindness to Jane, with an apology for troubling him also with Lizzie. Mr. Bingley was unaffectedly civil in his answer, and forced his younger sister to be civil also, and say what the occasion required. She performed her part without much gratefulness, but Miss Bennet was satisfied and soon after ordered her carriage. Upon the signal, the youngest of her daughters put herself forward. The two girls had been whispering to each other during the whole visit, and the result of it was that the youngest should tax Mr. Bingley with having promised on his first coming into the country to give it a ball at Netherfield. Lydia was a stout, well-grown girl of 15, with a fine complexion, and good-humored countenance, a favorite with her mother, whose affection had brought her into the public at an early age. She had high animal spirits, and a sort of natural self-consequence, which the attention of the officers to her uncle's good dinners and her own easy manners recommended her, had increased into assurance. She was very equal, therefore, to address Mr. Bingley on the subject of the ball, and abruptly reminded him of his promise, adding that it would be the most shameful thing in the world if he did not keep it. Its answer to the sudden attack was delightful to their mother's ear. I am perfectly ready, I assure you, to keep my engagement, and when your sister is recovered, you shall, if you please, name the very day of the ball. Lydia declared herself satisfied. Oh, yes, it would be much better to wait till Jane was well, and by that time, most likely Captain Carter will be at the Merryton again. And when you give your ball, she added, I shall insist on giving one also. I shall tell Colonel Foster it will be quite a shame if he does not. Miss Bennet and her daughters then departed, and Elizabeth returned instantly to Jane leaving her own and her relations' behavior to the remarks of the two ladies and Mr. Darcy. The latter of the two, however, could not be prevalent on to join in their censure of her, in spite of all Miss Bigley's witticisms on fine eyes. Chapter 10 The day passed much as the day before had done. Ms. Hertz and Miss Bingley had spent some hours of the morning with the invalid, who continued, though slowly, to mend. And, in the evening, Elizabeth joined their party in the drawing room. The low table, however, did not appear. Mr. Darcy was writing, and Miss Bingley, seated near him, was watching the progress of his letter repeatedly calling off his attention by messages to his sister. Mr. Hertz and Mr. Bingley were at Piquette, and Mrs. Hertz was observing their game. Elizabeth took up some needlework, and was sufficiently amused in attending to what passed between Darcy and his companion. The perpetual commendations of the lady, either on his writing, or the evenness of his lines, or on the length of his letter, with the perfect unconcern with her praises were received, formed a curious dialogue, and was exactly in union with her opinion on each. How delighted Miss Darcy will be to receive such a letter. 
He made no answer. You write uncommonly fast. You are mistaken. I write rather slowly. How many letters you must have to occasion to write in the course of a year? Letters of business, too. How odious I should think them. It is fortunate, then, that they fall to my lot instead of yours. I am afraid you do not like your pen. Let me mend it for you. I mend pens remarkably well. Thank you, but I always mend my own. How can you contrive to write so even? He was silent. I tell your sister I am delighted to hear of her improvement on the harp, and pray let her know that I am quite in raptures with her beautiful little design for a table, and I think it's indefinitely superior to Miss Grantley's. Will you give me leave to defer your raptures till I write again? At present, I do not have room to do them justice. Oh, it is no, of no consequence. I shall see her in January. But do you always write such charming long letters to her, Mr. Darcy? They are generally long, but whenever always charming, it is not for me to determine. It is but a rule with me that a person who can write a long letter with ease cannot write ill. That will not do for a compliment to Darcy, Caroline, cried her brother, because he does not write with these. He studies too much for words of full syllables. Do you not, Darcy? My style of writing is very different from yours. Oh, cried Miss Bingley. Charles writes in the most careless way imaginable. He leaves out half his words and blots the rest. My ideas flow so rapidly I do not have time to express them by which means my letters sometimes convey no ideas at all to my correspondence. You humility, Mr. Bingley, Elizabeth, must disarm reproof. The thing is more deceitful, said Darcy, than the appearance of humility. The indirect boast, for you are really proud of your defects in writing because you consider them as proceeding from a rapidity of thought and carelessness of execution, which, if not estimate, you think is at least highly interesting. The power of doing anything but quickness is always prized much by the processor, and often without any attention to the imperfection of the performance. When you told Miss Bennet this morning that if you ever resolve upon quitting Netherfield, you should be gone in five minutes, you meant it to be some sort of panegyric compliment to yourself. And yet, what is there to be so very laudable and precipitance that must leave every very necessary business undone, and can it be of no real advantage to yourself or anyone else? Hey, cried Bingley, this is too much to remember at night all the foolish things that were said in the morning. And yet, upon my honor, I believe what I said of myself to be true. And I believe at this moment... At least, therefore, I did not assume the character of a needless precipitance merely to show off for the ladies. I dare say you believed it, but I am by no means convinced that you would be gone with such celerity. Your conduct would be quite as dependent on chance as that of any man I know. And if, as you were mounting your horse, a friend were to say, Bingley, you had better stay till next week. You would probably do it, you would probably not go, and at another word might stay a month. You have only proved by this, cried Elizabeth, that Mr. Bingley did not do justice to his own disposition. You have shown him off now much more than he did himself. I am exceedingly gratified, said Bingley, by your converting my friend, says into a compliment on the sweetness of my temper, but I am afraid you are giving it a turn which that gentleman did by no means intend. For he did certainly think better of me if under a circumstance I were to give it a flat denial and write off as fast as I could. Would Mr. Darcy then consider the rashness of your original intentions as atoned by your obstinacy in adhering to it? Upon my word, I cannot exactly explain the matter. Darcy must speak for himself. You expect me to account for opinions which you chose to call mine, but which I have never acknowledged. Allowing the case, however, to stand according to your representation, you must remember, Miss Bennet, that the friend who is supposed to desire his return to the house and the delay of his plan has merely desired it, 
asked it without f- offering one argument in favor of its propriety. To yield readily, easily to the persuasion of a friend is no merit with you. To yield without conviction is no compliment to the understanding of either. You appear to me, Mr. Darcy, to allow nothing for the influence of friendship and affection. A regard for the requester would often make one readily yield to a request without waiting for arguments to reason one into it. I am not particularly speaking of a case as you have supposed about Mr. Bingley. We may as well wait, perhaps, till the circumstance occurs before we discuss the discretion of his behavior thereupon. But in general, in ordinary cases between friend and friend, for one of them is desired by the other to change a resolution of no very great moment, should you think ill of that person for complying with the desire without wanting to be argued into? It will not be advisable, before we proceed on the subject, to arrange whether more position to the degree of importance is to appertain to this request, or as well the degree of intimacy subsisting between the parties? By all means, cried Bingley, let us hear all the particulars, not forgetting their comparative height and size, for that will have more weight in the argument, Miss Bennet, than you may be aware of. I assure you that if Darcy were not such a great tall fellow, in comparison with myself, I should not pay him half so much defense. I declare I do not know more an awful subject than Darcy on particular occasions, and in particular places at his own house especially, and of a Sunday evening which he has nothing to do. Mr. Darcy smiled, but Elizabeth thought she could perceive that he was rather offended, and therefore checked her laugh. Miss Bingley warmly resented the indignity he had received, I see your design, Bingley, said his friend. You dislike an argument and want to silence this. Perhaps I do. Arguments are too much like disputes. If you and Miss Bennet will defer yours till I am out of the room, I shall be very thankful, and then you may say whatever you like of me. What you ask, said Elizabeth, is no sacrifice on my side, and Mr. Darcy had much better finish his letter. Mr. Darcy took her advice and did finish his letter. When that business was over, he applied to Miss Bingley and Elizabeth for an indulgence of some music. Miss Bingley moved with some alacrity to the pianoforte, and after a polite request that Elizabeth would lead the way which the other as politely and more earnestly negated, she seated herself. Miss Hertz sang with her sister, and while they were employed, Elizabeth could not help observing as she turned over some music books that lay on the instrument how frequently Mr. Darcy's eyes were fixed on her. She hardly knew how to suppose that could be an object of admiration so great a man, and yet he should look at her because he disliked her. It was still more strange. She could only imagine, however, at last she drew his notice because there was something more wrong and reprehensible, according to his ideas of right, than in any other person's present. The supposition did not pain her. She liked him too little to care about his opinion. After playing some Italian songs, Miss Bingley varied the charm by a lively Scottish air, and soon afterwards Mr. Darcy, drawing nearer to Elizabeth, said to her, do you not feel a great inclination, Miss Bennet, to seize on such an opportunity of dancing a reel? She smiled, but made no answer. He repeated the question with some surprise at her silence. Oh, she said, I heard you before, but I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste, but I always delight in overthrowing those kind of schemes and cheating a person of their predetermined content. I have, therefore, made up my mind to tell you that I do not want to dance a reel at all, and now despise me if you dare. Indeed, I do not dare. Elizabeth, having rather expected a front to him, was amazed at his gallantry. But there was a mixture of sweetness and archness in her manner which made it difficult for her to affront in anybody. And Darcy had never been so bewitched by any woman as he was by her. He really believed that, 
were it not for the inferiority of her connections, he should be in some danger. Miss Bingley saw or suspected enough to be jealous, and her great anxiety for recovering of her dear friend Jane received some assistance from her desire of getting rid of Elizabeth. She often tried to provoke Darcy into disliking her guest by talking of their supposed marriage and planning his happiness in such an alliance. I hope, she said as they were walking together in the shrubbery the next day, you will give your mother-in-law a few hints when this desirable event takes place as to the advantage of holding her tongue. And if you can compass it, do sure the younger girls of running after officers and if I may mention so delicate a subject, endurance to check that little something bordering on conceit and impertinence which your lady possesses. Have you anything else to propose for my domestic felicity? Oh, yes. Do let the portraits of your uncle and Aunt Phelps be placed in the gallery of Pemberley. Put them next to your great uncle, the judge. They are in the same profession, you know, only in different lines. As for your Elizabeth's picture, you must not have it taken for what painter could do justice to those beautiful eyes. It would not be easy, indeed, to catch their expression, but their color and shape, the eyelashes, so remarkably fine, might be copied. At that moment, they were met with another walk by Miss Hurst and Elizabeth herself. I did not know you intended to walk, said Miss Bingley in some confusion, lest they had been overheard. You used us abominably ill, answered Miss Hurst, running away without telling us she were coming out. Then taking the disengaged arm of Mr. Darcy, she left Elizabeth to walk by herself. The path just admitted three. Mr. Darcy felt their rudeness and immediately said, This walk is not wide enough for our party. We had better go into the avenue. But Elizabeth, who had not the least inclination to remain with them, laughingly answered, no, oh, no, stay where you are. You are charmingly grouped and appear to be uncommon advantage. The picture-esque would be spoilt by admitting a fourth. Goodbye. She then ran gaily off, rejoicing as she rambled about, in hopes of being at home again in a day or two. Jane was already so much recovered as to intend to leave her room for a couple hours that evening. Chapter 11 When the ladies removed after dinner, Elizabeth ran up to her sister and, seeing her well guarded from cold, attended to her in the drawing room, where she was welcomed by her two friends with many professions of pleasure. And Elizabeth had never seen them so agreeable as they were during the hour which passed before the gentlemen appeared. Their powers of conversation were considerable. They could describe an entertainment with accuracy, relate to an anecdote with humor, and laugh at their acquaintance with spirit. But when the gentleman entered, Jane was no longer the first object. Miss Bingsley's eyes were instantly turned towards Darcy. But this useless and worth remained for Bigley's salutation. He was full of joy and attention. The first half hour was spent in piling up the fire, lest she should suffer from the change of room, and she removed at his desire to the other side of the fireplace, that she might be further up from the door. He then sat down by her and talked scarcely to anyone else. Elizabeth, at work at the opposite corner, saw it all with great delight. When the tea was over, Mr. Hertz remained his sister-in-law of the card table, but in vain. She had obtained private intelligence that Mr. Darcy did not wish for cards, and Mr. Hertz soon found that even his open petition rejected. She assured him that no one intended to play, and the silence of the whole party on the subject seemed to justify her. Mr. Hertz had therefore nothing to do but to sketch himself on one of the sofas and go to sleep. Darcy took up a book. Miss Bingley did the same, and Miss Hertz principally occupied in playing with her bracelets and rings, joined now and then in her brother's conversation with Miss Bennet. Miss Bingley's attention was quite as much engaged in watching Mr. Darcy progress through his book as in reading her own, and she was particularly either making some inquiry or looking at his page. 
She could not win him, however, to any conversation. He merely answered her question and read on. At length, quite exhausted by the attempt to be amused with her own book, which she had only chosen because it was the second volume of his, she gave a great yawn and said, How pleasant it is to spend an evening in this way. I declare, after all, there is no enjoyment like reading. How much sooner one tires of anything than a book. When I have a house of my own, I shall be miserable if I have not an excellent library. No one made her any reply. She then yawned again to aside her book and cast her eyes around the room in quest for some amusement. When hearing her brother mentioning a ball to Miss Bennet, she turned suddenly towards him and said, By and by, Charles, are you really serious and meditating a dance at Netherfield? I would advise you, before you determine on it, to consult the wishes of the present party. I am much mistaken if there are not some among us whom a ball would rather be a punishment than a pleasure. If you mean Darcy, cried her brother, he may go to bed, if he chooses, before it begins. But as for the ball, it is quite a settled thing. As soon as Nicholas has made white soup enough, I shall send round my cards. I would like balls indefinitely better, she said, if they were carried on in a different manner, but there is something insufferable, tedious about the usual process of such a meeting. It would surely be much more rational if conversation instead of dancing were made the order of the day. Much more rational, my dear Caroline, I dare say, but it would not be so near like a ball. Miss Bingley made no answer, and soon afterwards she got up and walked about the room. Her figure was elegant, and she walked well. But Darcy, at whom it was all aimed, was still inflexibly studious. In the desperation of her feelings, she resolved on one effort more, and turning to Elizabeth, said, Miss Elizabeth, Bennet, let me persuade you to follow my example, and take a turn about the room. I assure you, it is very refreshing after sitting so long in one altitude. Elizabeth was surprised, but agreed to it immediately. Miss Bingley succeeded no less in the real object of her civility. Mr. Darcy looked up. He was as much awake to the novelty of attention in the quarter as Elizabeth herself could be, and unconsciously closed his book. He was directly invited to join their party, but he declined it, observing that he could imagine but two motives for their choosing to walk up and down the room together, which either of which motives his joining them would interfere. What could he mean? She was dying to know what could be his meaning, and asked Elizabeth whether she could at all understand him. Not at all was her answer. But depend on it, he means to be severe on us, and our surest way of disappointing him will be to ask nothing about it. Miss Bingley, however, was incapable of disappointing Mr. Marcy in anything, and perceived, therefore, in requiring an explanation of his two motives. I have not the smallest objection to explaining them, he said, as soon as she allowed him to speak. You either choose this method of the passing of the evening because you are in each other's confidence and have a secret affairs to discuss or because you are conscious that your figures appear to be the greatest advantage in walking. If the first, I would be completely in your way, and if the second... I can admire you so much better if I sit by the fire. Oh, shocking, cried Miss Bingley. I have never heard anything so abominable. How shall we punish him for such a speech? Nothing so easy, if you have but the inclination, said Elizabeth. We can all plague and punish one another. Tease him, laugh at him, intimidate him as you are. You must know how it is to be done. But upon my honor, I do not. I do assure you that my intimacy has not taught me that. He is calmness of manner and presence of mind. No, no, he may feel defy us there. And as to laughter, we will not expose ourselves. If you will please, by attempting to laugh without a subject, Mr. Darcy may hug himself. Mr. Darcy is not to be laughed at, cried Elizabeth. 
that is an uncommon advantage, an uncommon I hope it will continue for. It would be a great loss to me to have such an acquaintances. I dearly love a laugh. Spingley, he said, has given me more credit than he can be. The wisest and the best of men, nay, the wisest and the best of their actions, may be rendered ridiculous by a person whose first object in life is a joke. Certainly, replied Elizabeth. There are such people, but I hope I am not one of them. I hope I never ridicule what is wise and good. Follies and nonsense, whims and inconsistencies do divert me. I own and I laugh at them whenever I can. But these, I suppose, are precisely what you are without. Perhaps that is not possible for anyone. But it has been the study of my life to avoid those weaknesses which often expose a strong understanding to ridicule, such as vanity and pride. Yes, vanity is a weakness indeed, but pride, where there is real superiority of mind, pride will always be under good regulation. Elizabeth turned away to hide a smile. Your examination of Mr. Darcy is over, I presume, said Miss Bingley. I pray, what is the result? I am perfectly convinced by it that Mr. Darcy has no defect. He owns it to himself without disguise. No, said Darcy, I have made no pretense. I have faults enough, but they are not, I hope, of understanding. My temper I dare do not vouch for. It is, I believe, too little yielding, certainly too little for its convenience of the world. I cannot forget the follies and the vices of others so often as I ought nor are there offenses against myself. My feelings are not puffed about with every attempt to move them. My temper would perhaps be called resentful. My good opinion once lost is lost forever. That is a failing indeed, cried Elizabeth. Implacable resentment is a shade in a character, but you have chosen your fault well. I really cannot laugh at that. You are safe for me. There is, I believe, in every disposition a tendency to some particular evil, a natural defect, which not even the best education can overcome. And your defect is to hate everyone. And yours, if replied with a smile, is willfully to misunderstand them. Do let us have a little music, cried Miss Bingley, tired of a conversation in which she had no share. Louisa, you will not mind my waking Mr. Hurst. Her sister had not the smallest objection, and the piano fruit was opened, and Darcy, after a few minutes' recollection, was not sorry for it. He began to feel the danger of paying Elizabeth too much attention. The Chapter 12 In consequence of an agreement between the sisters, Elizabeth wrote the next morning to their mother to beg that the carriage might be sent for them in the course of the day. But Miss Bennet, who had calculated on her daughter's remaining at Netherfield to the following Tuesday, would exactly finish Jane's week, could not bring herself to receive them with pleasure before. Her answer, therefore, was not propitious, at least not to Elizabeth's wishes, for she was impatient to get home. Miss Bennet sent them word that they could not possibly have the carriage before Tuesday, and in her postscript it was added that if Mr. Bingley and his sister pressed him to stay longer, she could spare them very well. Again, again staying longer, however, Elizabeth was positively resolved, nor did she much expect it would be asked and fearful, on the contrary, as being considered as intrusing themselves needlessly long, she urged Jane to borrow Miss Bingley's carriage immediately, and at length it was settled that the original idea of leaving Netherfield that morning should be mentioned, and the request was made. The communication excited many professions of concern, and enough was said of wishing them to stay at least till the following day to work on Jane, until the morrow their going was deferred. Miss Bingley was then sorry that she had proposed the delay, for her jealousy and the dislike of one sister much exceeded her affection for the other. The master of the house heard with real sorrow that they were going to go real soon, and repeatedly tried to persuade Miss Bennet that it would be not safe for her, that she was not enough recovered. 
but Jane was firm where she felt herself to be right. To Mr. Darcy, it was welcome intelligence. Elizabeth had been at Netherfield long enough. She attracted him more than he liked, and Miss Bingley was uncivil to her, and more teasing than usual to himself. He wisely resolved to be particularly careful that no sign of admiration should now escape him, nothing that could elevate her with the hope of influence his city. Sensible that if such an idea had been suggested, his behavior during the last of the day must have material weight in confirming or crushing it. Steady to his purpose, he scarcely spoke ten words to her through the whole of Saturday, and though they were at one time left by themselves for half an hour, he adhered most conscientiously to his book and would not even look at her. On Sunday after morning service, the separation, so agreeable to all, took place. Miss Bingley's civility to Elizabeth increased at last very rapidly, as well as her affection for Jane. And when they departed, after assuring the latter of the pleasure it would always give to see her at either Longbourn or Netherfield and embracing her most tenderly, she even shook hands with the former. Elizabeth took leave of the whole party in the liveliest of spirits. They were not welcome home very cordially by their mother. Miss Bennet wondered at their coming and thought them very wrong to give so much trouble. It was sure Jane would have caught cold again. But their father, though very laconic in his expression of pleasure, was really glad to see them. He had felt their importance in the family circle. The evening conversation, when they were all assembled, had lost much of its animation and almost all of its sense by the absence of Jane and Elizabeth. They found Mary, as usual, deep in the study of thorough baths and human nature, and had some extracts to admire and some new observations on the threadbare mortality to listen to. Catherine and Lydia had information for them of a different sort. Much had been done, and much had been said in the regiment since the preceding Wednesday. Several of the officers had dined lately with their uncle, a private had been flogged, and it had actually been hinted that Colonel Foster was going to be married. Chapter 13 I hope, my dear, said Mr. Bennet to his wife, as they were at breakfast the next morning, that you have ordered a good dinner today, because I have reason to expect an addition to our family party. What do you mean, my dear? I know of no one that is coming. I am sure, unless Charlotte Lucas should happen to call in, and I hope my dinners are good enough for her. I do not believe she sees such at home. Person whom I speak is a gentleman and a stranger. Miss Bennet's eyes sparkled. A gentleman and a stranger. It is Mr. Bingley, I am sure. Well, I am sure I shall be extremely glad to see Mr. Bingley, but good Lord, how unlucky. There is not a bit of fish to be got today. Lydia, my love, ring the bell. I must speak the hill this moment. It is not Mr. Bingley, said her husband. It is a person whom I have never seen in the course of my whole life. This roused a great astonishment, and he had the pleasure of being eagerly questioned by his wife and five daughters at once. After amusing himself some time to their curiosity, he thus explained, About a month ago I received this letter, and about a fortnight ago I answered it, for I thought it was a case of some delinquency and requiring early attention. It is from my cousin, Mr. Collins, who, when I am dead, may turn to you all out of this house as soon as he pleases. I cannot bear to hear that mentioned. Pray, do not talk of that odious man. I do not think it is the hardest thing in the world that your estate should be entailed away from your own children, and I am sure if it had been you, I would have tried long ago to do something or other about it. Jane and Elizabeth tried to explain to her the nature of an entail. They had often attempted to do it before, but it was a subject on which Miss Bennet was beyond the reach of reason, and she continued to rail bitterly against the cruelty of settling an estate away from a family of five daughters in favor of a man whom nobody cared anything about. 
is a most inquitious affair, said Mr. Bennet, and nothing can clear Mr. Collins from the guilt of inheriting Longburn. But if you will listen to his letter, you may perhaps be a little softened by his manner of expressing himself. No, that I am sure I shall not. And I think it is very impertinent of him to write to you all, and very hypocritical. I hate such false friends. Why could he not keep on quarreling with you as his father did before him? Why, indeed, he does seem to have some filial scriptures on that head, as you will hear. Huntsford, near Western Hand, Kent, 15th October. Dear Sir, the disagreement subsisting between yourself and my late honorable husband always gave me such uneasiness, and since I have the misfortune to lose him, I have frequently wished to heal the breach. But for some time I was kept back by my own doubts. Festering at least seemed disrespectful to his memory for me to be on good terms with anyone whom it had always pleased him to be at with a variance. There, Miss Bennet. My mind, however, is now made up on the subject. For having received ordinance at Easter, I have been so fortunate to be distinguished by the patronage of the right honorable lady Catherine de Berg, widow of Sir Louis de Berg, whose bounty and benevolency has preferred me to the valuable rectory of this parish, where it shall be my earnest endeavor to demean myself with grateful respect towards her ladyship, and be ever ready to perform these rites and ceremonies which are instituted by the Church of England. As a clergyman, moreover, I feel it my duty to promote and establish the blessing of peace in all families within the reach of my influence. And on these grounds, I flatter myself that my present overtures are highly commendable, and that the circumstance of my being next in tale of Longbird Estate will be kindly overlooked on your side, and did not lead you to reject the offered olive branch. I cannot be otherwise than concerned at being the means of injuring your admirable daughters, and beg to leave to apologize for it, as well too as to assure you of my readiness to make them every possible amends. But of this here after, if you should have no objection to receive me into your house, I propose myself satisfaction and waiting on you and your family Monday, November 18th by 4 o'clock and shall probably trespass on your hospitality till the Saturday the night following, which I can do without any inconvenience as Lady Catherine is far from objecting to my occasional absence on a Saturday, provided that some other clergyman is engaged to do the duty of the day. I remain, dear sir, with the respectful compliments to your lady and daughters and your well-wisher and friend, William Collins. At four o'clock, therefore, we may expect this peacemaking gentleman, said Mr. Bennett, as he folded up the letter. He seems to be a most conscientious and polite young man, upon my word, and I doubt not will prove a valuable acquaintance especially if Lady Catherine shall be so indulgent to let him come to us again. There is some sense in what he says about the girls, however, and if he is disposed to make any amends, I shall not be the person to discourage him. Though it is difficult, said Jane, to guess in what he can mean to make us the atonement he thinks are due, the wish is certainly to his credit. Elizabeth was chiefly struck with his extraordinary deference for Lady Catherine and his kind intention of christening, marrying, and burying his parishioners, whatever it were required. He must be an oddity, I think, she said. I cannot make him out. There is something very pompous in his style. And what can he mean by apologizing for being in the next entail? Can we not suppose he would help if he could? Could he be a sensible man, sir? No, my dear, I think not. I have great hopes of finding him quite the reverse. There is a mixture of civility and self-importance in the letter which promises well. I am impatient to see him. 
In a point of composure, said Mary, the letter does not well seem defect. The idea of the olive branch perhaps is not wholly new, yet I think it is well expressed. To Catherine and Lydia, neither the letter nor its writer were in any degree interesting. It was next to impossible that their cousin should come in a scarlet coat, and it was now some weeks since they had received the pleasure from the society of a man in any other color. As for their mother, Mr. Collins' letter had done away with much of her ill will, and she was preparing to see him with the degree of composure which astonished her husband and daughters. Mr. Collins was punctual to his time and was received with great politeness by the whole family. Mr. Bennet, indeed, said little, but the ladies were ready enough to talk. And Mr. Collins seemed neither in need of encouragement nor inclined to be silent himself. He was a tall, heavy-looking young man of five and twenty. His air was grave and stately, and his manners were very formal. He had not been long seated before he complimented Miss Bennet on having so fine a family of daughters, and he said he had heard much of their beauty, but that in this instant fame had fallen short of the truth, and added that he did not doubt her seeing them all in due time disposed of in marriage. This gallantry was not much in the taste of his heirs, but Miss Bennet, who quarreled with no compliments, answered most readily. You are very kind, I am sure, and I wish with all my heart it may prove so, for else they will be destitute enough. Things are settled so oddly. You allude, perhaps, to the entailment of this estate. Ah, sir, I do not. It is a grievous affair to my poor girl, she must confess. Not that I mean to find fault with you for such things, I know, or all chance in the world. There is no knowing how estates will go once they come to be entailed. I am very sensible, madam, of the hardships to my fair cousins, and could say much on the subject. But that I am cautious of appearing forward and precipitate. But I can assure the young ladies that I come prepared to admire them. At present, I will not say more, but perhaps when we are better acquainted. He was interrupted by a summons to dinner, and the girls smiled on each other. They were not only the subjects of Mr. Collins' admiration. The hall, the dining room, and all the furniture were examined and praised, and his accommodation of everything would have touched Mrs. Bennet's heart. But for the mortifying superstition of his viewing it all of his own future property. The dinner, too, in turn was highly admired, and he begged to know which of his fair cousins the excellency of its cooking was owing. But he was set right there by Miss Bennet, who assured him with some asperity that they were very well able to keep a good cook, and that her daughters had nothing to do in the kitchen. He begged pardon for having displeased her. In a soft-ended tone, she declared herself not at all offended, but continued to apologize for a quarter of an hour.